Hello everybody, uh, welcome to another chapter reading. Uh, of course, I'm Catherine Fogelman, author of Tales of the Woblin. This is chapter 11 of The Dragon Sun, the first book that I ever wrote and I am now rewriting. I thought it was high time to uh, get up, get in another uh, update chapter update. Things have been a little slow. I've been pretty, uh, pretty busy, uh, but trying to get in a little bit of writing every day, if possible. Uh, so, I have completely <laughs> lost track of, oh wait, I have a book right here in front of me. Uh, I've almost completely lost track of, uh, which chapter is what now uh, this chapter 11 is right after uh, Susan in the first book or in the original uh, right after oh hey look at this all right looking at my book now my old the original book chapter 10 was trouble at the river where uh, Susan and Keegan uh, met a creature that should not exist as Susan fell into the river, nearly drowned Keegan and Ardor, his horse, had to save her. I have, um, I did do a little bit of changing to chapter 10, not a lot, the, most of it's still the, still the same. I've changed up, uh, made the the two twin boys a little more cute and adorable, and then just increased the danger of it. Took a little more time to get into a, a description of the monster without interrupting the flow of, of the danger. And then right off the bat in chapter 10, I, whenever you meet this monster, you get the sense He's not necessarily trying to hurt anybody. And then the whole thing, everybody ends up in the river accidentally. And you realize because this monster caused everybody to basically end up in there. And just immediately got put in the mind of the reader, this monster is stupid, strong, and dangerous. Anyway... I'm not supposed to be talking about chapter 10. I'm supposed to be talking about chapter 11. So, anyway, because I increased uh, some of the danger and a little more uh, character progression and whatnot in chapter 10, uh, there's a little more bulk to chapter 10. So I had to essentially split it. So, where this would have been still part of chapter 10 I, I've had to split it um, uh, I should also say this will become important a little bit further down that when Keegan was trying to save Susan it's just not working and now that I know a little more and have done more research on rivers and what it's like to get stuck in one and how almost drowning is like and everything getting a little more correct on some of that uh, I realized Keegan was definitely going to need some help getting Susan out and so his rain flashed and gave him a huge burst of energy and uh, very cool in chapter 10 but yes not without consequences uh, all right, so this is the beginning of chapter 11. Uh, Keegan had kind of wrapped, uh, Saul helped Keegan pull Susan out of the water and everything, get them all situated. He helped Keegan get onto Ardor and loaded Susan up and Keegan's taking her straight home and Saul's bringing the kids. So, uh, yes. Susan, what happened, Keegan? Uh, Jormand reached up as Keegan slowly lowered her into her father's arms. She fell in the river. We have to get her warm. Keegan slipped off Ardor's back and followed Jormand toward the house. The door opened and two women stepped out. 
One of them was an older woman in a patchwork dress holding a covered basket, a grass belt tied around her waist with a number of cut flowers and herbs hanging from it. A very small one-legged owl sat on her shoulder. The other woman, Susan's mother, gasped and rushed forward. What happened? She took Susan's hand and held it tightly. Susan, speak to me. Marthian, run inside, get some of that hot tea brewing. The other woman shuffled forward and grabbed Susan's mother by the shoulders, gently pulling her out of the way and shoving her toward the house. You fellers take the child inside. Lay her next to the fireplace. Keegan narrowed an eye at the old woman, immediately recognizing her as the village herbalist. Well, you've got nice timing. Comma. The old woman grabbed Susan's feet and jerked her stockings off, rubbing her gray toes to warm them. I would have been all the way in town had that old man not sent me here. Said someone had gone and drowned themselves and I was desperately needed. Thought he was fibbing till now. Keegan frowned. Doesn't take a scholar to figure out who sent her. Well, Neff. Of course it'd be that old man. Your Jorman growled, looking at Keegan. Help Martha and clear the floor in front of the hearth and find blankets. Keegan nodded, his eyebrows knit. He hurried inside and shoved the table and chairs farther to the side while Marathian cleared away a few toys and dragged a rug closer to the hearth. Once the floor was clear, Keegan helped Jormans rest Susan on the rug in front of the fire. Now then, ye menfolk get! Marathian and I can take care of the girl. Herbalist forcibly shoved Keegan and Jormand outside, slamming the door behind them. The two men stared at the door in silence, until it opened and Marthian handed a blanket to Keegan with a shiv quivering hand. Thank you, son. Get yourself warmed up. I'll have a cup of tea ready for you in a moment. Keegan took the blanket with a soft smile and, no and a nod. When she closed the door, he stepped over to our door and began to rub the stallion down with the blanket. Where are the children? How did Susan fall into the river? She's more careful than that. Jorman began to pace. What happened? There was a monster. Keegan peered Cylon at Jormand. Looked human, but tall. Black fine fur over its entire body. Cat-like eyes. Strong enough that it toppled Ardor. Seen anything like it? Jorman's eyes slowly widened at the description, then lowered. They shifted in thought for a long moment before he knit his brows, his face growing stormy. No, but... I might know someone who does. Keegan raised an eyebrow. The old man? Jorman jerked his head up, his eyes sharpening. How do you know about him? Met him at the crossroads yesterday morning. Jorman's expression hardened. Dark things follow him like the plague. He's no good. He looked to the side, then glanced up the road. Where are the children? They're coming. Bringing Susan's rescuer with them. An old friend. Jorman fixed Keegan with a hard stare. You didn't rescue Susan? Not alone. Keegan continued to rub Ardor down. Jorman sighed, rubbing the back of his neck. What happened to the monster? Ran further upstream into the forest. Keegan paused and looked back at the older man. I wouldn't recommend hunting it. Jorman let out an ironic chuckle. Form a hunting party? As if anyone would believe such a tale. Monsters are children's stories. Folk don't hunt fairy tales. Keegan snorted. You believe it, though? Jorman took a deep breath. You and I have both seen things. Enough to know it's unwise to believe otherwise. Keegan nodded, taking a deep breath. He leaned on Ardor as a wave of fatigue washed over him unexpectedly. He lifted his hand and looked at his ring. Sunlight glinted off the golden dragons on the silver band, and the sparkling red stone in the center faintly flickered with light. The warm energy that had been pulsing through Keegan's body began to fade, slipping back into the ring. He stood straight and shook the blanket out, wrapping it around his shoulders before taking a seat on a log next to the porch. Jorman continued to pace until the children came into sight with Saul. Telic sat on sh Saul's shoulders, and Marlik was riding the horse with Talia and Ma Malia. Tila and Malia. Sheesh, I can't even get my own names right in this. All right, my bad. Arden walked close beside them. Jormand hurried toward them. After speaking with the children, he greeted Saul with a handshake and took the little boy from his shoulders. 
Arden helped the other children down from the horse. Then they took the reins from Saul, leading the animal to the barn. Arden split off from them and hurried up to Keegan. Do you want me to rub our door down? Keegan leaned back against a post on the porch, the fatigue growing heavier on him. I already did, but I'm sure he'd like some oats. Ardor lifted his head and looked to the teenage boy, nickering expectantly. Arden wrapped his hands around the stallion's nose, stroking it. How is Susan? Keegan lightly shrugged. You'll know when I know. Arden knit his brows and nodded, then led the stallion to the barn. Jorman and Saul approached them, both looking at Keegan. You don't look so good, Saul said, his brows knitting with worry. Keegan blinked wearily. I'm fine. Jorman looked up at Saul. Did you witness what happened? Saul shook his head. I was following the river down from the hills when I heard a scream. Someone called Keegan's name. Thankfully, it didn't take me long to spot them. In short, no, I did not see what happened. He turned his gaze to Keegan, narrowing his brown eyes. How did the two of you fall in, if I may ask? Keegan exchanged a glance with Jormund, watching the older man's expression turn stormy. Do you believe in monsters? Keegan turned back to Saul and watched as the man squinted his eyes and lifted an eyebrow. Saul eyed him cautiously before finally answering, Depends on what kind. Keegan closed his eyes, trying to think of a way to explain what happened to Saul. He cracked an eye open when he sensed Jormund to move closer. The older man knelt next to Keegan, looking him over. You've gone pale. Are you sure you're okay, son? Keegan sighed, closing his eyes again. I'm tired. Keegan? Son? Jarman gasped and wrapped an arm around him as Keegan felt himself slip from his seat to the ground. Keegan! The desperate cries around him grew distant as his exhausted mind slipped deep into darkness. His last thought was why the warm... Uh, was why? Was wondering why? His last thought was... I don't know. His last thought was wondering why the warm golden glow in his chest fluttered in panic. Yeah, I don't know. I'll have to go back over that. Keegan felt utterly alone. The screams of the dying raked across his ears. Bloodied swords cut through the air over his head. The mangled bodies of friends and family surrounded him. He was overwhelmed, his feet firmly rooted in place. Not again. His big brother, Brayden, stopped a man in black armor from hurting Keegan, only to take an axe in his back. Tori was lying on the ground, his blank eyes staring at the smoky sky, the last vestiges of tears streaming down the sides of his dirty face. Somewhere in the chaos, Alia was screaming for help. Why am I living through this again? Through the mashup of memories and fears, Keegan could not look away from the scene that haunted him the most. He watched his father die again, stabbed repeatedly by the scarred man. Keegan pushed his fingers through his hair, gripping at his scalp, as he watched his father fall to the ground. His mother ran up to his father, screaming as she pulled him into her arms, unaware of a man behind her with a raised sword. Keegan reached out with a single hand. No! Stop! All of the chaos came to a sudden halt. All of the people were frozen in place. Keegan glanced around. All around him. Eh, yeah. Keegan glanced all around him. There was no movement anywhere. His eyes narrowed. This is no mere nightmare. His gaze finally settled on a shadow beyond his father and mother. It was the silhouette of a tall woman, black as midnight, weaving and rippling like a puddle of ink. Two icy blue eyes opened in the dark face of the silhouette, looking directly at him. Did I not spell silhouette right? I did not. Too many L's. My bad. Keegan recoiled in unexplained fear as something primal and cold crawled up his spine. You, you did this. You killed my family? Suddenly, she was directly in front of him. She towered over him, her soulless eyes boring into his.
Keegan stumbled backward, nearly falling to the ground as her cold voice whispered in his head. No, you did this. Look again. Keegan risked a glance to the side. His eyes went wide as he saw all the blood that had been spilled, forming a pool around him. He stepped away from the pool, but it followed him, splashing across his bare feet. He reached down and tried to wipe the blood from his skin, but to no avail. He turned back to the shadow, watching as the corner of its eyes narrowed with a smile. The power of life and death is held in your hands. This is why you will be mine. Keegan's heart beat like a drum in his chest. He had heard this woman's voice before, in the dream with Erewhon. He grit his teeth and glared at, whoa, glared at her. Who are you? The shadowy woman's eyes went wide. The world around them both shifted and bent, the images of the massacre fading away. Just as they disappeared, they were replaced by new images. Keegan glanced around, his jaw going slack. They stood in the middle of what had once been a mighty city, its towers and walls broken and smoldering. Shadows of people were imprinted on the stone walls, still sizzling, their hands raised in pleas of mercy. Two gigantic skeletons stood beyond the silhouette of the woman. I spelled silhouette wrong. Enormous claws reaching for her. Keegan gasped when he realized they were dragons, twice the size of Fargon. They had been burned so quickly their flesh had turned to ash, but their metallic scales had melted and fused their bones together. Who am I? The shadow asked, glaring at Keegan. Who am I? A slow, malicious chuckle reverberated from her, making her double in size. I am she of the forgotten people. She reached out with a shadowy figure, finger and touched Keegan's face, causing suffocating pain to erupt through his entire body. I am the dragon's foe, the paladin's doom, and the wovelin's bane. I am... A flash of light and a swirling mist erupted between the two of them, shoving the shadowy woman away from Keegan. Walnuff appeared in the swirling mist and pointed a finger at her. You are a monologuing witch, that's what you are. Nobody cares about your titles. He spun around to face Keegan. Wake up, boy, and make yourself useful for once. The shadowy woman hissed. Felnost, you meddling old. Old man? Keegan opened his eyes. He was standing in the corner of a little one-room house. The floor was dusty and cobwebs were in the corners of the ceiling. However, a warm fire burned in the hearth, with a pot of bubbling water hanging over it. Walnuff sat on a stool in front of the hearth, next to an empty rocking chair. He had a single hand resting on the arm of the rocking chair and stared into the fire, his diamond blue eyes hazy and distant. Falnost! Keegan recognized the angry voice. He watched as the door burst open. Jorman stepped into the room, his glaring eyes drifting to the old man's hand on the chair. His face softened the slightest for a moment before turning hard as stone. He fixed his brown his brown he fixed his brown eyes to the back of Walnuff's head. I told you to stay away from my family. Walnuff blinked and sat up straighter, taking a deep breath. And how have I gone against those wishes? Keegan told me he met you. I know you. Nobody meets you by chance. Jorman ran his fingers through his hair, his face flushing red with anger. Not two hours ago, Keegan and Susan were attacked by a monster, nearly drowned, and now Keegan is lying in my house, unconscious. Walnuff reached down and poke, poked a stick into the fire. He'll be fine. He overextended his abilities, but will recover. German began to pace. But what about when he wakes up? Will more monsters come after him? Or after my little ones? I told you to stay away from my family for a reason, Felnost. Walnuff looked over his shoulder at the man. Keegan is not your son, German. Therefore, he is not your family. German lunged toward the old man, arms shaking with rage. He is my son! 
He is not my blood, but he is a part of my family. And I will not have you meddling and bringing calamity to my family. Walnuff narrowed his eyes, slowly standing to his feet, squaring his shoulders and facing Jormund. You know Keegan is different, Jormund. You have always known. Why then do you blame me for what you knew was to come? Jormund hesitated, gritting his teeth and water pooling in his eyes. Finally, he poked a finger into Walnuff's chest, forcing words past his tight throat. I blame you, because when you show up, everything good dies. Walnuff's eyes narrowed further, and he leaned toward Jormund. Keegan has a dark past behind him and an even darker future ahead of him. You can continue to blame me for all misfortune that comes your way. However, one day you will realize that you should have been guarding against the horrors your son would bring in his wake, rather than keep your sights trained on me. Jorman turned and stormed out of the house, slamming the door behind him. Walnuff sighed and turned back to the fire, leaning a hand against the hearth. He stared at the flickering flames for a long moment before tensing. He glanced around, his diamond blue eyes stopping directly on Keegan. Didn't I tell you to wake up, boy? He strode across the house to Keegan and thumped him between the eyes. Keegan sat straight up in bed, sat up straight in bed, my bad, slapping a hand over his forehead with a howl of pain. Yep, that worked. He turned toward the voice, locking his steaming eyes onto Marlek and Telek. Marlek quickly slipped a slingshot into his pocket, his eyes going wide. Keegan lowered his hand from his forehead, peering at a spot of blood on his palm. He looked to the side of the bed and spotted a tiny pebble lying next to him. He glared at the two little boys. Telek pointed at his twin. Marlek did it! You told me to! Marlek shrieked. Keegan swung his legs over the edge of the bed, but before his feet could touch the floor, the two boys had bolted from the room. He heard the clattering of pots, then the slam of the outside door. You little imps, Susan's voice chided from the other room. What have you two done? Keegan stepped out of the room, glaring at the outside door. Two gentle arms suddenly wrapped themselves around his middle. He looked down into Susan's smiling face, her cheeks pale but her eyes sparkling. I'm so glad you're awake, she declared, hugging him tightly. Keegan embraced her, grimacing when his stomach rumbled. Susan pulled away with a soft giggle. I have a remedy for that. Sit down. She moved over to the fireplace, checking on some cooking bread before pulling a pot away from the fire. She lifted the lid, filling the room with a savory smell. Keegan moved to Susan's side, staring at a meaty stew in the pot. How long have I been asleep? A full day, Susan stirred the pot, glancing up at him. The healer said to make sure you drink lots of water. The bucket is full. She nodded at the water bucket in the corner. Keegan hesitated, looking Susan over. I've wasted a full day sleeping. Susan shushed him. Not another word until you've drank water. As Keegan filled a cup with water, the door to the house opened. Saul walked in, carrying a basket of potatoes. He halted abruptly and stared at Keegan in surprise. His gaze shifted to Susan and a frown formed on his face. I thought I told you to take it easy and let me do the work. Susan huffed. It's just lunch, Saul. Cooking a little meal won't kill me. Saul rolled his eyes to Keegan. Good to see you up again. Is Susan always on her feet? Susan narrowed her brown eyes at Keegan in a threatening squint. Keegan tried to keep a straight face as he finished off his water. I think she even sleeps on her feet. Susan placed her hands on her hips. Well, you men folk do well enough outside in the field, but if it weren't for a woman being run off her feet, this house and those children would be a sad sight indeed. Besides, there's no telling what you would eat. Saul exchanged an amused glance with Keegan, then set the basket of potatoes next to the door. Steak and potatoes are pretty good. Not all year round. Really, it's a wonder men can survive without women at all. Susan used her apron to gingerly put a hot loaf of bread onto the table. Saul moved next to her, grabbing a rag and pulling the next loaf out himself. Susan stomped a foot. I'm not helpless, you know. 
Saul smiled. I know. Just take a moment to enjoy the extra help today. He pulled a chair out for her, then took the pot from over the fire, settling it onto the table. Keegan watched as the two went back and forth, a small smile turning up the corners of his mouth. They were already acting like an old married couple. Keegan had only just met Saul, but he'd known Susan for the last ten years. He'd never seen anyone get under her skin so easily. Keegan was no expert at relationships, but he did know where there's smoke, there's fire. Keegan re refilled his cup and took another drink as the two continued to bicker. Guess only time will tell. All right, and that's chapter 11. So chapter 12, I'll be focusing on uh, Keegan and Saul kind of talking, uh, Saul explaining where he's been uh, for the last 13 years after the massacre, and uh, that he has been taking care of Alia and uh, Brena and kind of just building the call to action for Keegan there. And um, yeah, I may end that uh, Keegan, I will have it where Keegan doesn't leave immediately because it is coming into summer harvest uh, for them, for Susan's family. So uh, with that in mind, Keegan doesn't want to leave right away. He wants to help them take care of harvest and then Saul is like, yeah, that's okay, no problem. Uh, and planning to, he was like working in the south and the girls expected him, Ollie and Brena expected him to be a while, a long while. And uh, so he's like, sure, I'll stick around. I'll help you with the harvest. We'll get it done faster that way. And then we can go together. So uh, that will be the kind of the basics of chapter 12 and I'm looking forward to getting to that and also putting in little bits uh, to help further Saul and Susan's uh, relationship so I think the two of them are absolutely adorable so yeah anyway uh, if you've read the original and the the first edition of The Dragon's Dew. Uh, let me know what you think of this new chapter 11 uh, versus like the second part of chapter 10 before. I, I feel like personally gets a little more in depth for character. Uh, helps kind of flesh out the thing going on between Saul and Susan there at the end and uh, of course a new couple of new creep or a new creepy dream and gets a little more into Walnef too kind of building some suspicion there so uh, yeah and if you've not read the uh, first edition of the Dragon Sun then you can go ahead and leave a comment let me know what you thought uh, anything that you caught that you felt like could maybe be different or whatever, you know, hey, I like comments on the videos. I like seeing people's opinions. So, yeah, anyway, hope you enjoyed this. Keep an eye out for another update eventually. It might be chapter 13 or 14 that I update on. And, uh, yeah so anyway thanks for sitting through if you've gotten this far to the video